Oh 
Would you give him one more standing ovation? Lord, we love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you. Let's say thank you to the worship team, shall we? Thank you. 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 Now turn around and look at four or five people and just point at them and say, I'm glad you're here. Well, let's do a baby dedication. How's that sound? That's fun. I'd like the Panagos family to come on down if you would. Um, this is one of our most cherished families in our church right here. They are near royalty. They are near royalty. Um, if you look around at any corner of the church, you will find a member of the Panagos family. They, Paul, it is so good to see you, brother. Tell Jennifer I said hi. I heard she's expecting. Hey, oh, my goodness. You guys might be up here doing a baby dedication pretty soon. All right, come real close. You guys are the stars. Come on close right here, right here. Come stand right here. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. 
Remind me of her name. Athena. Athena. Oh my goodness, that's beautiful. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Lord, we bring Athena to you this morning. You formed her in her mother's womb. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that her bones will be strong. That she'll live a long, healthy, happy life. Everybody who sees her will know that she is a daughter of the King. Lord, everyone that is around her will love the Lord more because of her. And there will be a line of people following her to heaven. Bless her. Let her have sweet dreams. Let her have sweet sleep every night of her life in the name of Jesus. I pray that evil people will always be away from her and stay away from her, never come around her. I thank you, Lord, that there's an anointing on her life. Lord, bless her. Long life, healthy and happy and laughing, laughing, that she'll constantly be laughing, Lord. Give her joy, joy that is immeasurable, Father. Let everyone say of her, she's always laughing. She's always joyful. She's always happy. Bless her now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. That's it. Give them another round of applause. How precious. How precious. All right, well, if you are a visitor here today, we are glad you're here. I know coming to a new church is kind of like, I don't know these people. I don't know if I'm going to like them. I don't know if I like bald-headed preachers or not. If that's the case, you're out of luck because every pastor in the woodlands, every single one, um, but we are glad you're here. We are glad you're here. If you do me a favor and pull out your cell phone, all the visitors, and download the Celebration Church app, because in a moment, I'm going to share a message, and all my notes are inside of that app. So just go to your app store, type in Celebration Church TW, and, um, and our app will come up. You can just hit it, and you'll see our notes. If you are a guest in this room... Um, Micah wants to take you out to lunch this afternoon, so. But if you are a guest in this room, uh, we're about to receive our tithes and our offerings. Uh, For those of you that don't know, a tithe is 10% of your income. You can find it in the Old Testament. You can find it in the New Testament. It's a tenth. It belongs to God. It is not yours. It's not mine. It belongs to God. Some people say, you know, I want to give them 10% of my income, but, you know, by the end of the week, I don't have anything left. I want to promise you, if you give him the first 10%, the first 10%, you will begin to see God's signature in your life in places that you never, ever have before, ever. Um, But if you're a guest... You just keep on interviewing us. Don't touch your purse. Don't touch your wallet. The next few minutes is just for people who call Celebration Church their church home. Let me encourage you with this scripture. It reads like this. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. You are all rich. Every single one of you are rich. If you've ever been to a third world nation, you know you're rich. If you've ever been to another side of town, you know you're rich. Uh, If you live in this northwest Houston area, you are rich. If you're in Spring, Conroe, Montgomery, you are rich. If you're in the woodlands, you're rich. You are rich. If you're in this room, you're rich. You woke up this morning and you looked in your closet and you're like, huh, I got so much clothes. Which, what should I wear? What should I? You're rich. You're filthy rich. So I don't feel rich. That's part of the strategy of the enemy. You don't feel rich and you're always just a little bit closer to being secure. If you could just make this much, you imagine it. You imagine, that's what the scripture says, you imagine your wealth a fortified city. It's not real, it's your imagination. 
It's your imagination that the more you have, the more protected you will be, the more secure you will be. But you thought that when you worked at Burger King at 14 or 16. You just wanted to just, if I could just make $7 an hour, I'll be straight. I remember making four twenty-five an hour at Paco's Tacos, thinking the people that were working the cash register that were making $7 an hour is like, if I can ever make $7 an hour, I will be loaded. When you know that that thought follows me all and it follows you it follows us all if we just make a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more you know how much money you need to be completely secure a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more but I want to say make that a commitment in your life the first 10% belongs to God Lord we love you bless your people Bless them. Do inventory of their life and bless them where they need it most. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's say thank you to Isaiah for being so awesome on the keys. You know, I was, I think I was uh, 25 and I think he was 23 and I saw him at another church years ago and he was playing and he completely distracted me. I could not feel God, could not hear God. I was just like, that guy is so good on the keys. He's so good. He's so good. And I'm so happy you're with us. I really am. All right, there's a bunch of people watching online. I just want to tell you, if you are the one watching on your iPhone or your laptop or you're super smart and you know how to like throw it up on your TV, um, I honor you. The only reason why you're watching the service today is because you love God and I honor you for that. They can't hear you. I'm sorry, they can't see you, but they can hear you and I want them to feel a part of the room. Would you put your hands together for them? Come on. This is for you. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Frankie Mazapika. The title of my message is The Voice of God. In uh, Mark chapter, th- uh, chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 3, it says this that there's the, the voice of God, the word of God. It's, it's like a farmer who grabs seed and throws it out. He throws it out. It's a type and shadow of how generous God is in sending his words to the earth. In communicating with you as his daughter. In communicating with you as his son. It's a parable that Jesus told to show how generous the words of God are. And as he tells this parable, he starts talking about how there are certain things that come in and pull the word out of your heart. What does that look like? It's it's like when you hear the word of God or you feel the word of God in your spirit. You can't hear it, but you, you feel it right down in here. And you get excited about it. The enemy comes in as quick as he possibly can. To snatch that word to where you don't even remember you had it. So I want to talk to you today about how to hear the word of God. The words of God. I want to talk to you how to discern whether it's whether or not it's you talking to you. Or whether it's God talking to you. To this day, to this day, there are moments where I know that I'm hearing God like I know my name. And then there's other times where I think it's God, but I'm not 100% sure. I, I, I need some more confirmation. I'm not quite sure. And so I want to talk about those things. And the last thing I'm going to talk about are the things that snatch it, the things that pull it. Are you ready? Say yes. yes. Ooh, you sound good. If you shout like that, I'll preach much quicker. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> all right, let's get right into it. First of all, let's establish how powerful the Word of God is. If, if you talk to the angels, 
they will tell you that God's voice is so powerful that when God looked at the darkness of the universe, just his words lit it up with galaxies of stars. If you talk to Ezekiel, he will tell you that his voice is so powerful that he causes dead souls to come to life again. He causes broken relationships, dead relationships to be renewed with more love than they ever had before. And he would say this because he saw the voice of God move through a valley of dry bones and they all came back to life. If you talk to Luke, the physician, also an apostle, he will tell you of how the voice of God was so powerful that it cast Satan himself out of heaven and he shot through the floor of the city of heaven like a lightning bolt. But if you talk to Matthew about the voice of God, he may tell you of the tenderness in the tone of his voice when he says, all of you who are tired and weary, come to me. I will give you rest. See, there's a certain rest that only the presence of God can give you. Your pillow can't give it to you. Have you ever woken up and thought to yourself, I just woke up, I'm exhausted, I want to go back home and go to bed. Say yes. yes. I just want to go back to bed. There's a tiredness, a weariness that your pillow cannot fix for you. There's a weariness that a vacation can't fix. Have you ever come home from your vacation and need a vacation from your vacation? Say yes. Yes. Let me hear you say yes. yes. It's, it's, there are certain emotions that are so vexing and so stressful, only the presence of God can do it. And he says, when that happens, come to me. I will give you rest. The voice of God creates. The voice of God brings people together. The voice of God causes hearts that are like stone, to be ripped out and replaced with a heart of flesh. That's what Ezekiel would tell you in 36, 26. But how do you and I hear that voice? I want to talk about three ways. The first way is when you open up the Bible and you read the scriptures. Now, this is something that we have a propensity to overlook because the Bible is always sitting there. If we're not careful, it'll gather more dust than affection. It's always sitting there. It's always available. And so we don't really value it as much as we should because it's always available. It's always sitting there. But let me tell you how it comes to life. First of all, let me give... A scripture to validate that it really is God's word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 it says all scripture. How much scripture? All. all scripture is inspired by God. And is useful for doctrine, reproof, correction and instruction in righteousness. All scripture from cover to cover is the inspired words of God. About three years ago, I decided I was going to amp my prayer life up. I was going to start praying more than I've ever prayed before. I was going to get up earlier. I was going to pray longer. I'm just going to pray, pray, pray. And I started getting really discouraged. Because what I was praying for was God's power to be seen when I pray. I started getting discouraged because months went by and nothing was changing uh, when I pray for people, nothing was changing in my personal life. And I started to wonder, I wonder if 
I'm going to be a person who just prays a lot, but I never see his power. I never see people get healed. I never see miracles. I'm just a person who prays a lot. And so I started getting really discouraged. So I, I was going to sleep one night and I opened up my iPhone. I figured I'd just read a few verses and go to sleep. And so I went to Romans chapter 5 and I was just reading. And all of a sudden I came across this verse in verse 5 of chapter 5 in the book of Romans. It said these exact words. Your hope will not end in disappointment. I knew at that moment, I had already read about 20, 30 verses prior to Romans 5, 5. But when I read that, I knew at that moment that God was telling me, your hope will not end in disappointment. Just keep on praying. I knew it at that moment. Maybe, maybe that's a word from you. Now, I want to say, there will be long stretches of reading where you think to yourself, I don't even know why I'm reading. I'm not even going to remember this by the time I'm done. Just keep on reading. The Holy Spirit will be faithful to cause it to come alive. In Ephesians 6, 12, uh, no, 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 uh, uh, 4, 12, 4, 12, 4, 12. Um, Hebrews 4, 12. It says that the Word of God is living and active. How does that happen? How does it go just from a book to living and active? It's the Holy Spirit. <sighs> he breathes on it. And all of a sudden you hear the word of God. If you're desperate to hear God, open up that Bible and just keep on reading. Just keep on reading. Or just keep on reading. The second way to hear from God is from another believer. When another believer says something to you, you know it's God. Now, sometimes another believer will say, God told me, and then they say it to you, and you don't know if God told, really told them, or did they tell themselves, and they're telling you now. Have you ever been there? Say yes. You're like, I don't know. I don't know if that's, if that's God or not. It sounds like you're trying to tell me something here. This is how you know if it's God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, it says that the spirit of prophecy encourages one another. It strengthens one another. It comforts one another. If you're not feeling encouraged, if you're not feeling strengthened, if you're not feeling comfort, just say, thank you, girlfriend. <laughs> thank you, girlfriend. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know how many times I've looked at somebody who came up to me and said, God told me to tell you, and I'm like, thank you. Cuckoo. And just move on. If you're not feeling strengthened, if you're not feeling encouraged, if you're not feeling comforted, then just push it away. Now, some people may say, well, it, it, it's, 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 if you're being bad, then, then God's going to correct you. But he has a unique way. He has a, he has a unique way of correcting. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, it says this, that godly sorrow, when you feel guilty, godly sorrow, it leads to repentance, brings salvation, and leaves no regret behind. It's almost like he corrects you while you're enjoying it. It's like, I know I did something wrong, but I just I thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for your grace. Thank you. I want to be close to you. I want to be near you. Thank you. So you feel the forgiveness at the same time as you feel the invitation for him to be close to you. The best way I can describe it is if you're following a one-year-old and they're trying to learn how to walk, they don't even know how to bend their knees yet. They're just kind of wobbling. And then all of a sudden, bang, they fall, boop, and and then you come up right behind them and just scoop them up and set them down. All of a sudden, they failed, but they feel the delight of being carried. And in that moment, it's his kindness that draws you to repentance. So when you get scooped up and you're back on your feet again, you realize, I need to watch that step. Thank you. Do you see that? Are you with me? Say yes. The third way that you hear from God is right down in here. 
It's, it's not out loud. It's in the moment. You're not reading the script. It's in the moment. You just, you feel it. You feel it. Um, my, my mother in the Lord, Jeannie Mayo, she was up in Canada about I don't know, 22 years ago. And she met this young lady. And while she was up there, she was up there speaking at this massive conference. And she met this young lady. And she looked at her. She was only 19 years old. And, and she felt the Spirit of the Lord. Not out here. She just felt it. This one's for Frankie. She comes home. I'm 21. She says, I think I met your wife. I said, well, we need to do something about this. We need to do something about this right now. She brought her down six or seven months later. Three days after I met her, we were dating. Today, we've been married for almost 20 years. We have three kids, two dogs, and nine chickens. My goodness, pray for us. She just heard it. It was right down in here. How do you discern? How do you discern and make sure that what you're hearing is true? First of all, you go back to the scriptures. If what you think you hear is contrary to the Bible, you have to say what I heard is not from God. It's from me. And oftentimes you will hear people say, I've heard from God. And you're like, I don't think you heard from God because the Bible says the exact opposite of what you're saying right now. He will never contradict himself. Uh, here's another way. Is if you take a word from God that you believe that you've heard. And you share it with mature believers. People that you trust. People that you know walk with God. And they respond back to you and say, ah. I don't know. I would say to you, walk carefully. You may have a blind spot. That's how you can test the word of God. Another way that you can hear God is right down in here in a moment and you can test it. Here's an example. Uh, we went to Costa Rica last week for five days, and uh, we were praying for the sick, and we were out in the street passing out food. And, but I also had a few meetings with some pastors, and I wanted to know if our church and their church should partner. And um, I was walking out the door before I flew there, and uh, the director of our prayer ministry, Miriam um, and Brian, uh, Miriam said this. She goes, hey, Pastor, when you see those other pastors, in a second, you will know. Uh, the first word out of their mouth, you will know if we're supposed to partner with them or not. The first pastor we sat down with, I felt so bad for him within the first 60 seconds because I knew I was wasting his time. I felt so bad. We're, we're, you're a good guy. Your church, they're good people. Our church are awesome people, um, but we're, we're not supposed to work together. I felt so bad because I knew I was wasting his time. I knew I was wasting my time. The next pastor I talked with, we walked in there into his church. He sat down, I sat down, we looked at each other, and I knew we are going to work together. Not a word has been said yet. I knew. You could feel the presence of God in the room. You could literally feel the presence of God. You say, how do you feel the presence of God? Several ways. Sometimes, like Job, in Job chapter 4, verse 15, he says, I felt the presence of God graze past my face, and the hair on my body stood up on end. Oftentimes, you will feel that. It's just like this little brush. It's almost, some people say, it feels like goosebumps. Sometimes, you get emotional. That's for me. That's what I feel. I, I feel like I'm about to cry. I just I, Something's in this room, and I'm about to cry. There's several different ways that you feel it. Sometimes, uh, there, I'm, I'm chasing rabbits now. Now. But we just knew, we just knew that the presence of God was in that room. Now, here's the thing. The moment you know God spoke to you, you have to know this. All of hell knew that you were blessed. All of hell. You say, I don't think hell knows. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel will tell you that hell knows when you're about to be blessed. Hell saw an angel coming down to Daniel to bless him. And they said, hurry up. And they met that angel in the air and fought the angel for 21 days. 
They can tell. They can see it coming. And they try to stop it. They want to come in and steal. And so Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 4. He said, watch out for the birds. The birds. Imagine like just like a, 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 a sea of black bats flying over your head and they'll swoop down and they'll take that word. How do you know when they've taken a word? Let's just use this as an example. Here the preacher is talking and you, you, you feel something from God and, and you're excited. You can feel the excitement, but Monday morning, the excitement is gone. You're doubting you even heard from God. You're not excited about it anymore. By Tuesday, you can hardly remember it. That's a a bat from hell, a bird from hell swooped down and took it. It, He took it. We must remember Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against evil rulers and authorities in an unseen world that's walking in parallel to us. We can't see it, but it's in parallel to us. You go, ah, it's hard for me to imagine. Here's an easy way to grasp it. When you're walking and you feel wind, the wind is moving, you're moving, but you can't see it. It's right there. It's right there. It's right there. Uh, Radio waves, sound waves. When your phone all of a sudden starts ringing in your pocket, those waves that came down and hit your phone and caused a response, there are things happening around us all the time that we cannot see. And Ephesians 6, 12 says this. He says, we are not wrestling against people. It's not your mother-in-law. Well, it might be your (laughs) mother-in-law. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against evil rulers and authorities in an unseen world. We are wrestling against mighty powers in this dark world. What kind of world is it? It's a dark world. When you know that people are walking around with a device that can show pornography in a nanosecond, this is a dark world. It's a dark world. I want to chase that rabbit, but I won't. Uh, Evil rulers and authorities. And then it says this, evil spirits in heavenly places. These are the bats that fly down. And then it says this, that the, the, the seed, the word of God, something that you got so excited about, it gets, it, it dissolves. It just goes away because it lands on shallow soil. Shallow soil is is when a person is not fully rooted in the Word of God. They're not very mature. They believe in Jesus. They look to Jesus. They will be in heaven one day. But the trouble is, is they're not very mature. And so when hard times come, you don't see them for like nine months. And this is why being in the house of God is so important. People can say, well, I can feel God everywhere. I don't have to be in the house of God. Well, uh, I might want to second think that. Because Psalms 26 verse 8, it says, I love the sanctuary of the Lord because it's where his glorious presence dwells. You say, well, God's presence is everywhere. The The manifest presence is different from the omnipresence. The omnipresence is everywhere. But the The manifest presence are places on the earth where he says, I will meet with my people right there. And it goes all the way back to the tabernacle in, in the wilderness. I will meet with my people right there. I would not suggest you back up and say, ah, I'll roll the dice on that one. I wouldn't, because people who are in the house of God, hearing the word of God, worshiping God with other believers, they become seasoned so that when trouble does come, when it comes, not if, (laughs) when it comes, you will be able to handle it. Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he says, do not think it's strange when Tough times when trials come to test you as if something strange is happening to you. 
See, people that are immature, they're growing, they're young. When bad things happen to them, they go, God, what? did you turn your, why did you do this to me? And I would say back, that's because you have, the soil in your heart is thin. You're not recognizing what God does and what the evil spirits do. You can't tell the difference. It's, it's too thin. It's too shallow. When we went to Costa Rica, I'll use another example. Uh, on Tuesday, we said, we're going to go out and we're going to pass out food to the poor. And then we're going to pray for healing. And so we passed out the food and we said, hey, is there anyone here who needs a healing in their body? And so people lined up and nobody was healed. Not one person. And I thought, oh my goodness. I went back to the hotel and laid in the hotel and thought, I need, I'm going back home. I'm going back to the Woodlands, Texas. I'm going back to Celebration. People get healed every Sunday at Celebration Church. I need to get out of Costa Rica. And then as I laid there, I started thinking, I don't, this is true. I don't even know if I'm called to the ministry anymore. That's how bad it was. Honestly, I started thinking, maybe I should open up a snow cone stand on the beach somewhere. This is not going good. And then there was a, something on the inside of me that said, Frankie, come on. Throw that resignation letter away. Come on. Do you think it's strange? So I woke up the next morning and went right back out to the streets. And I promise, I promise, I promise. I thought to myself, I'm not leaving Costa Rica until somebody gets healed. I'm not leaving. In the evening, we, were, we had some people there. And I said, does anyone here need healing? And a guy raised his hand and he says, I'm completely blind in one eye. I said, I just saw somebody at home in the woodlands get healed of both eyes. You only need one eye? This is going to be easy. <laughs> we prayed for him. I said, can you see now? He's like, I, I see better. So, well, then we're going to pray again. So we prayed. He goes, I'm seeing mucho better. I said, well, great. We prayed for him again. We put somebody like 20 feet away to hold up numbers. He's like, six, four, five. I said, are you 100%? He goes, 99%. <laughs> I said, look, you're going to have to live with 99%. I don't even know how to measure percents. How, how do we know when we're 99 to 100? I, I don't even know if I'm 99%. And then the seed gets thrown among thorns and worry and the lure of wealth chokes it out. But the Lord said to the ones that the word goes to, to, to soil, to good soil. In their life the word will come in and then it will come out and it will produce 30, 60, 100 fold. Does anybody want that in their life? Come on. 100 fold. 100 fold. The word of God needs to be like a treasure that we chase. Let's not teach ourselves how to live without the presence of God. Let's not teach ourselves. How to get through problems without the presence of God. When we choose to not have an appointment with him. We are saying with our actions. I think I can manage without that appointment. That appointment is the most powerful moment of your day. If you have to get up earlier, get up earlier. Say, I don't have time to pray. You do have time. You just don't want to get up earlier. There's always time. The most, the, the worst thing I ever did was train and run in half and full marathons. That was the worst thing I ever did. Because after about seven or eight or nine of them, of waking up at 4 a.m. to run, So I could get a medal that cost them two cents. But I was so passionate about it, I thought to myself, 
my goodness, Frankie. You would get up at 4 a.m. to make sure that you get your run in before work? Come on. But don't feel convicted. Don't feel bad. I'm just making a point. There's always time available. It's just whether or not the pillow gets it and not you. You say, I'm not good at waking up in the mornings. Who's good at waking up in the mornings? If you are, and there's probably about 10% of you, I love mornings. I'm a morning person. The rest of us don't like you. (laughs) God wants to heal you. He wants to bless you. He wants his power to not only come in you and rest on you so that you can have a life and life more abundantly. But you are on this earth to share what he's given you. That's why you're here. That's why you're here. If it was just to experience the presence of God, he'd bring you to heaven. He'd just bring you to heaven. But you are what the Bible calls a vessel. In, out. In, out. Yeah, if I, I have nothing to give out. Make sure you go get something in. Are you with me? I want to share the testimony that we shared last Sunday. And um, if you missed it, this is your opportunity to see it. And um, if you've already seen it, I'm sure you'll enjoy it again. Take a listen to this. Mi nombre es Rosalio García. Aproximadamente hace unos tres años yo empecé a a ver menos de lo que yo veía. Pero yo pensé que, como, como había ido con el doctor y me dijo que después de 40 años uno empieza a perder la vista. Entonces me recetaron lentes de hace unos 10 años atrás, más o menos. Pero al correr del tiempo de hace tres años yo veía menos y menos. He first went to Mexico to get um, procedures done in his eyes. Um, they told him he was, uh, it was started with cataract and then they led to coming back to Houston, went to other ophthalmologists here, to other eye doctors, and they started telling him there was glaucoma, did procedures, started with shots on his eyes, and then they said that he needed laser surgery. So they did that in both eyes. And the first day he started seeing after the procedure, but as the time kept passing by, the vision start, he started losing the vision little by little. Completamente lo perdí de completo, el, el 100%. About two weeks ago, he just started, he wasn't seeing at all. Um, it was just a shadow that he was able to see. He could sit right next to me and he'll tell me, I, I don't see you, I don't see your face. I just don't see your face. Este, le dije a mi esposa, vamos a donde van los muchachos de nosotros, mi, mi hijo, mi nuera, la familia de ellos. Le dije, ellos van a una iglesia que dicen que está allá por el lado de Woodland, Texas. Vamos. My husband asked my mother and all that Sunday morning, you know, what made you come here? You know, why did you come? And my mother-in-law said, to, um, your dad said he's ready for his miracle. Y entonces este, el pastor dijo que los que quisiéramos pasar a, adelante allí en su, en su en el púlpito y ahí que él iba a orar de igual cual pasamos y me dijo él que que iba a orar por mí en mis ojos que cerrara mis ojos y puso los sus manos en mis ojos y y yo nomás dije bueno señor si es cosa tuya que yo sé que es cosa tuya yo voy a recibir mi milagro, mi milagro si tú me lo das ¿no? Y cuando el pastor terminó de orar y me dijo, abre tus ojos, ven, ven mi cara. Y yo lo vi a él como es. Y yo le dije, sí, sí, sí alcanzo a ver. Y digo, okay. Mi nombre es Rosalio García, aproximadamente veo. Le digo a mi esposa cuando yo fui allá, le dije, bonita, le dije, ahora sí te veo lo guapa que era siempre. <risa> le dije, todavía Dios, todavía, todavía me, 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 me regresó mi vista para ver todavía. 
doy gracias a Dios y invito a los que me escuchen que no se aparten del Señor que Él todavía en aquellos hace dos mil años que anduvo aquí en la tierra hizo milagros y los ha venido haciendo y todavía los sigue haciendo y yo soy uno de ellos, un milagro del Señor. I, I apologize to this whole center section. I thought when it when it glitched, I thought it was done. So I came up. If you want to watch it again, uh, you can go to the Celebration Church YouTube channel and it's on there. Um, the, the, the only joy that I have more than praying for people and seeing them get healed is watching you guys pray for people and seeing them get healed. I mean, like, I smile so big it hurts my face. And it's because it's the passion of my life to help you be a closer disciple of Jesus Christ. It's the passion of my life. Uh, we, we have an adult discipleship class that I teach once a month. It's uh, after the second Sunday. It's the second Sunday of every month after this service. Today is the second Sunday. If you want to come to it, you can register right now. You have to register right now. It's in the app. But only the pre-registrants were able to register to have food during the class. But if you say, look, I'm not even hungry, but I want to go to the class, then register. You, you have to register. Uh, we have uh, Gestapos that walk around and say, I don't see your name. So all you got to do is register. It's free. If you say, oh, I, I do, but I got kids. We have child care um, that will help you and take care of them for you. Let's all stand to our feet for me, please. If you read the scriptures, every time Jesus showed up, something powerful happened. It's important that you hear that. Every time Jesus showed up, something powerful happened. It's just what happens when his presence is in a room. It's just what happens. And his presence is in this room. It's a massive difference. It's a world of difference. Of people who believe that God used to do miracles and people who actually see them right now. The first pastor that I talked with in Costa Rica, I was telling him uh, about the miracles that we get to experience together. And uh, he goes, well, I'm sure there are some pastors in Costa Rica that agree with your theology. He goes, not me, but there are some. And I was like, I've heard about people like you. And he's looking at me saying, I've heard about people like you. It's just a world of difference. We just believe that he does it today. And that's why we see the testimonies week after week after week. I want to say this again. Most of the miracles happen when prayer partners pray with people down here. And so I usually only pray for two or three people and they pray for everyone else and that's where all the miracles happen. John, do you still have that manila folder? These are not including the last few weeks. These are the emails that have come in. It's like almost a half a ream of paper. And... It's in, this, it's in this beat up manila folder because I carry it in my backpack. Every time I get discouraged, I take it out and I just, like, oh yeah. So if you get healed at Celebration Church and you don't tell us about it, shame on you. Because you really are touching his glory by not giving it to him. 
I would be touching his glory if I said, well, people only get healed because of me. God will strike me down for that. So you have to give it to him and I have to stay away from it. But there's a lot of miracles inside of here. I'll tell you who I would like to pray for. I, I feel compelled to pray for individuals. You have a sickness or an illness and it's scaring you. It scares you. I, I have, if it's you, I want you to come out of your seat. Maybe there's nobody here that fits that category. When, when I used to run marathons, I, I, um, I got injured and it just made me mad. But I knew six to eight weeks, nine weeks, I'll be fine. But then there's certain illnesses, it scares you. And I don't believe that the Lord wants you to live like that anymore. And so I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's cancer. I don't care if it's deafness, eyes. I don't care what it is. You're breathing. I feel like I'm supposed to pray for somebody who's respiratory. You're having respiratory issues, just breathing. Is there somebody in this room? I just feel like I'm supposed to pray for somebody who's... Is it you? Come here. Come here. I want to pray for you. I know it's scary to say me. Last Sunday, oh my goodness, during Easter, we had three Easter services and I had three names that the Lord gave me. In the first service, I shared three names. Nobody put their hand up. Second service, Sunday morning, I shared the three names. Nobody put their hand up. I was like, well, here's a little dose of humble pie just for me. Third service, I asked again. Two of the three were accurate. One of them, I don't know if, I don't know. But one of them was, I think it was a, a lady named April. Said, I got a name named April and this is what it is. But she didn't come down. But after the service, she came down. Debbie caught her, brought her and introduced me to her. And she didn't raise her hand because this was her first time ever in Celebration Church. And she got spooked out of her mind. So she didn't come down. And I'm walking around thinking, oh, I missed it again. I know it's scary to put your hand up. But you risk walking out the same way you did when you walked in. I'm not, gonna enter, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm just going to take my mic off and pray for you. Thank you for coming down. Is there anyone respiratory issues or you have something that is scaring you? First one is respiratory. Second one is scaring you. Are you in the first category or second? Second one. Are you in the first category, respiratory, or something that scares you? Okay. Okay, these are the people I want to pray for right here. Thank you. You're not going to walk out afraid. Here, get, help them get in line. Now come close together because other people are going to come down. I want to be able to find you. Just shoulder to shoulder. Shoulder to shoulder, John. Thank you. Now prayer partners, I want you guys to come down. And I want anyone else who needs to pray about anything. The greatest moment in Costa Rica was this guy who said, he came walking up. I said, what can I pray with you about? He goes, I need to give my life to God. That was the greatest. It's the greatest one we saw. Because that's an eternal decision. These bodies, they, they have an expiration date on it. But eternity goes forever. So if you need to give your life to the Lord, does she need me to pray for her? Is she in this category? Okay, get her shoulder to shoulder. Everyone else, if you need to pray about anything, just come down here and let a prayer partner pray with you. There's no official dismissal. You can leave whenever you get ready. But let's sing this song one time through before anybody leaves. And if you're in the adult discipleship, 
when the worship is over, the class will start probably 10 minutes or 15 minutes after that. Be blessed in the name of the Lord. I love you all so much. 